Good morning. Uh, all right, so we're continuing with the second part of uh, the special lecture on Navier-Stokes equations, right? So let's recall where we are. Where first of all, what we need to remember always is, irrespective of whether we are dealing with a solid or a fluid or a gas for that matter, um, so a liquid or a gas. So as long as we have a continuum assumptions, the equations that govern the motion of, uh, a, of a continuum, they are the same. So we have the essentially equations of balance, mass balance, linear momentum balance, angular momentum balance, etc. right? Those are the three that we have concentrated on. And in that context, uh, mass balance and linear momentum balance is there, they're what we're concentrating on, and angular momentum balance is satisfied through the symmetry of the Cauchy stress tensor because we're looking at a particular class of so-called nonpolar materials. So the situation is the same for a fluid, and uh, in particular, we are looking at incompressible flows, and therefore, the mass balance essentially becomes something which says that the velocity field is solenoidal or it's divergence free. So that is now um, appropriately regarded as a constraint that we, we essentially need to satisfy if we're trying to solve for the velocity field within our problem domain. Then we look at the linear momentum balance, and the linear momentum balance takes as its most critical argument the stress. And then for a fluid, we or at least for a uh, the type of fluid that we are interested in, we try to figure out what type of function uh, we are dealing with. And uh, essentially, it turns out that that function is related to the velocity gradient. Why? Well, first of all, um, the, the, the object, the continuum we're dealing with, needs to get deformed in order to generate stresses. However, uh, in comparison to a solid material, uh, when, where we look at implicitly the deformation gradient, or that is a function of the displacement gradient, right? If you take a piece of fluid, yes, it needs to get deformed, but the thing is the displacement itself does not generate a stress because I can take a bowl of fluid, stir it vigorously, the particles have moved all over the place, but then I let it rest and there is no stress in it. So the stress is not generated through displacement really, but through the velocity. Okay? And moreover, uh, in this sense, similar to a solid, if I take a solid object and I just displace it, it shouldn't generate a stress. And therefore, if I have a uh, domain of fluid and everything gets translated with the same fluid, uh, with the same velocity, I will not generate a stress again, okay? omitting the inertial parts. Right? So therefore, what is happening is that in order to generate a stress, I need to somehow have similar to displacement gradients, velocity gradients. So that's why I'm throwing in L in there. However, that's not the whole story because similar to, again, a, to, a, to a solid object, I know that the material should not be sensitive to rotations when it tries to generate a stress. Okay? And we interpreted the in the decomposition of the velocity gradient, the skew symmetric, the vortice tensor, as something that has to do with rotations. And therefore, I then, we then argued that W should not play a role in the stress. And therefore, here we really should not see L, but rather D, the symmetric part of the velocity gradient tensor that has to do with the, the, the rate of stretch of uh, volume elements um, along the principal directions of D, if you like. Okay. So then we want to write a relation for essentially uh, T, and we have the constraint of incompressibility. And in that setting, by making a relation to um, incompressible linear elasticity, we argued that the pressure is not something uh, that we have a explicit expression for, like let's say some bulk modulus times the trace of epsilon, which in the case of linear elasticity governs volume change, but rather it's an unknown on its own, and mathematically it would be, let's say, a Lagrange multiplier that enforces a constraint. Uh, so that's identity plus two mu 
D. Okay, and D is already trace free due to this constraint. And therefore, this is a relation that one can immediately deduce, let's say, uh, following similar arguments, in fact, from, from um, incompressible linear elasticity. Okay? Um, all right, so that's where we are. And again, we're looking at a very special case. The, here we observe a linear relation between the velocity or the velocity gradients and the stress. This is not necessarily the case. This is a very specific case where we're looking, we're, we're looking at Newtonian viscous flow where there is a linear relation plus everything else is a constant due to that linearity constraint. For instance, the viscosity does not change, let's say, with the magnitude of the shear rate. Okay, so there is no, let's say, shear thinning or shear thickening as you might observe in a non-Newtonian fluid. All right, so this is the expression that we are dealing with. And afterwards, we substituted that expression into the linear momentum balance. That's pretty much what we did the, as the very last thing last time. Um, and after also somehow um, moving the, um, the, um, the body force contributions into the pressure and really interpreting the pressure to, have, to, to, to contain that body force. And it's called the head, but not without explicitly denoting as such. Remember, first I put a P tilde, and then I removed the tilde saying, OK, let's remember that it contains the body force. After doing all of that, we ended up with that expression. Okay? And these are the Navier-Stokes equations, minus gradient P plus Laplacian, Laplacian divergence gradient of V is equal to rho times acceleration. And we have to also remember here that the acceleration is a nasty term. Uh, the expression looks deceptively linear in the velocity, which would be very nice, but it's not because we have the pointwise time rate of change plus the terms that are associated with the gradients of the velocity. Okay, a convective term. Um, so that is a highly nonlinear equation to solve for. All right. So now, based on that slightly simplified form where I got rid of the body force conveniently, now let's look at a um, series of simplifications um, that one could follow in order to solve these equations because as they are, the equations are very hard. So sometimes it's, adva it's advantageous to actually um, talk about simpler situations. Okay? And one of these is, or perhaps one of the simplest ones is irrotational or potential flow. So, um, well, the irrotational constraint is that the curl of the velocity is equal to zero. And I argued last time or told you that a, a sufficient condition for this to happen is that V comes from a potential. But in fact, under well-defined circumstances, for simple domains, etc., this is also a necessary condition. In other words, for this to happen, V must be of that form. So that's a if and only if statement. So now we have an expression for the velocity, and there is a potential uh, that a, the velocity potential, as we called it last time, from which the velocity needs to come from. And we have our mass balance, and the mass balance says that divergence of V has to be equal to zero, and divergence of V after substituting this expression is nothing but the Laplacian of the flow potential or the velocity potential, and that should be equal to zero. So this is from mass balance. Okay. Um, so now, that by itself actually is already an equation. That's a classical Laplace problem. Laplacian of some scalar field is equal to zero. And again, depending on the boundary conditions and the, the, um, the domain, et cetera, there are very well 
defined methods for solving such an equation, analytically and numerically. So it's beautiful, and in fact, if you have appropriate boundary conditions, in particular on the velocity within your domain, then this equation by itself is solvable, okay? So here I will write maybe solvable on its own. And in fact, in your undergraduate fluid dynamics course, you may have actually solved uh, for this problem in simple, let's say, two-dimensional settings. So now, well, you might think, well, is this the only thing I have to deal with? Well, no, there is, of course, also the linear momentum balance that you have to deal with. But what you do is, if the problem is nicely posed, you solve for phi tilde of xt, okay? Um, and then you plug that into the linear momentum balance, and linear momentum balance has in it the velocity and the pressure, right? Now the velocity is not anymore an unknown because I've solved for phi, you plug it into that relation, you know what the velocity is, and in your linear momentum balance, the only thing that remains is the pressure. And in other words, the problem becomes solving for phi and then post-processing the pressure from linear momentum balance. Again, under nicely posed settings, okay, in a nicely posed problem. So from linear momentum balance, post-process, let me say, p tilde of x t, and you're done. So it, it, it looks really nice because the problem becomes much simpler. Um, now, is this, however, a assumption that we can always make? Is it useful? Well, the answer is very short. This is not a realistic assumption. Um, almost no flow field is irrotational. In fact, there are well-defined paradoxes associated with irrotational uh, flows that, again, you might remember from your undergraduate fluid dynamics. However, the problem is so nice that it would be clever to make use of it if possible. And indeed, that's what people do, because in some circumstances, the flow field that you get, the velocity field you get from the solution of such a problem may not be the one that you're looking for, but it may have the characteristics of it. And therefore, you might do something to correct it in a cheaper way than having to solve the full Navier-Stokes equations from scratch, all right? So you solve for that, or, and, then, and then subsequently you somehow augment it, you correct it, et cetera. So it's not realistic. But from the perspective that I just mentioned, may be useful nevertheless. So, that's the very first special flow that one might be interested in as a simplification of the full set of Navier-Stokes equations. The second one is inviscid or Euler flow. So in this case, again, the idea actually it suggests itself. You start with the Navier-Stokes equations, minus gradient p plus mu Laplacian of the velocity, but you say that the flow is inviscid. In other words, we're going to omit the contributions from the viscosity. So there is no mu Laplacian v. We throw it out and simply write rho v dot. Okay. So, um, mu is essentially taken as zero. Um, is the problem very simple? Well, not really, because there is still the nonlinearity of v um, when you expand the acceleration. I'm sorry, a nonlinearity in the acceleration when you expand uh, the, the, the material time derivative. But still, it's a simpler problem. Okay? Um, and where does this assumption work? We're going to recall the definition of the Reynolds number, but it works at high um, Reynolds number flows. So it's a meaningful approximation where pressure variations 
um, are mostly due to inertial effects. Inertial effects meaning the right hand side. Okay, so in fact, it turns out uh, that, for instance, you're trying to analyze the flow around an airplane. So away from the surfaces of the airplane, if you're trying to figure out the flow field, well, it's a high Reynolds number flow for sure because of the velocity that are velocities that are involved. It turns out away from the surfaces of the plane, this is an equation that people typically apply. Okay? Again, it's not an easy equation, but it's certainly easier than having to solve for the full thing. But one has to be careful. It's only valid where pressure variations are mostly due to inertial effects. As you approach the surfaces of the airplane, what happens is that the viscous forces start to dominate because on the surfaces there, are, there is a no-stick boundary condition. So, and away from the surfaces, however, the fluid moves freely, so there the viscous forces are actually important, and that is called, that region is called, within a certain region near the surfaces, the boundary layer that you might remember from your undergraduate fluid dynamics. So you have to be away from boundary layers. So I will write here just, just one example, flow around an airplane. Okay. Right. So, so it is a realistic simplification in some highly useful scenarios. We just have to keep in mind that it's just a simplification to make your life easier. It's still not super easy, but easier than having to solve the full set of equations. Um, all right, so there is the high Reynolds number approximation to the full Navier-Stokes equations. Now you might guess, of course, that there is also a low Reynolds number approximation. And that is called creeping or Stokes flow. So we're going to essentially say that the velocities which are involved are small. So when you look at the acceleration term, v dot, that is equal to del v del t plus gradient v operating on v, but that second term is quadratic, nonlinear in v, and because we're going to say that v is small, okay, so that essentially will correspond to a low Reynolds number approximation, okay, um, v dot is going to be approximately del V del T because the second term is nonlinear, okay? And in fact, people typically omit that term as well, okay? So you commit, um, completely omit inertial effects. So here the idea is that you have negligible inertial effects negligible compared to what compared to the viscous forces that are um, involved, right? So in that case, you start again with the full set of Navier-Stokes equations, minus gradient P plus Laplace, you know, the velocity is equal to zero, okay? So now, this for sure is, a, oh, again, a much nicer problem. Again, it may not be easy. The domain might be complex. Um, for instance, this is a problem that is typically due to the suitability of the assumption if you have flows in micro devices, if you have flow in a porous medium, okay, um, then this is the type of assumption that you would use. So in that case, the domain is super complex. You have to resolve the geometrical, uh, let me say, intricacies, but the equation is linear in the pressure always, but also in the velocity because you've got rid of the right-hand side. Okay, and plus it doesn't depend on time in this case. So it's a nice equation um, to solve for. So here I will write um, flow in porous media. Uh, Microfluidic devices, etc. 
So those are the three sets of simplifications that one typically follows. And again, this is a realistic assumption in such cases, and people make use of it because it's easier to solve for. Now, however, if that is not the case, or if you're interested in something more in the physics of the problem and how the, the, the let me say, the transition from, let's say, a low Reynolds number to a large high Reynolds number flow, and you'd you like to resolve everything in one numerical, let me say, framework, then you have to solve for the full set of Navier-Stokes equations, right? Uh, now, in that case, to understand what is happening, it's also useful to take these equations and put them into non-dimensional form, right? So let's briefly recall how that was done. So these are our equations, right? And we would like to non-dimensionalize them. So let me raise these and I will summarize the procedure. Um, so the idea is uh, that we are going to start with these equations, the constraint on the velocity field, which says that del vi over del xi is equal to zero. And also, now I'm writing them explicitly in index notation in component form because we'd like to see the um, simplification or the non-dimensionalization, uh, how it works essentially. So we have del vi over del t plus del vi del xj bj. Okay. Okay, so the idea is that you introduce non-dimensional variables. And for instance, you'd like to work with non-dimensional time. And so let's call those variables that are indicated with a star. So we have our usual time, and we'd like to scale it by some, non, some reference value. Okay, so T naught is some reference value. There isn't a single way to pick this reference value, but there are ways of picking it. But so far, let's say just some reference value. And when we're talking about the position, and in fact, any component of the position or every component can be scaled independently from each other. But let's just say for the purposes of this present discussion, let's say we scale all of them by the same reference value. Let's call it X, actually capital L naught. Okay, some reference length. Um, and then, likewise, the velocity is going to be scaled by some reference velocity V0. And finally, the pressure is going to be scaled by a reference value. Okay. Um, now, if you just make that non-dimensionalization without specifically um, choosing explicit expressions for, let's say, T naught, P naught, et cetera, then you can certainly get one type of non-dimensional form, okay, where you will have several non-dimensional variables appearing. And also, depending on which ones you choose to further specify and how you specify them, you can end up with different non-dimensional forms, again, as you might remember from your undergraduate fluid dynamics. We're going to make here a simple choice that gives us a non-dimensional form that contains only one variable, non-dimensional variable, namely the Reynolds number. And for that, we're going to choose P naught to be um, simply the density times the reference velocity squared. Okay? Um, this is something that has to do with also, or in units, you can check, it's also Newton per meter squared. Okay? So that's one choice. And then we are going to choose the reference time to be the time it takes for this reference length to be traversed by this reference velocity. Okay? Um, so that is our reference time, and that's it. 
And let me say, let's say V naught, what does that correspond to? You choose a reference length that has to do with the dimensions of the structure that you're trying to analyze, let's say. And V naught, let me say, is the order of magnitude that the velocity experiences in terms of change. So from one side of this flow to the other side, it changes by a certain amount over a length L naught. Let's say V naught represents that amount. So that's how you would figure out, let me say, a value for V naught. Okay, um, so if you make these specific choices, then all you see in your non-dimensionalization is, apart from T, L naught, V naught, and rho is already a variable that we know. That's the density and it's a constant. And then you go ahead and plug it in here, okay? So I'm marking it red, so under that particular assumption, you end up with now a new non-dimensional form, <coughs> which, so first of all, let me squeeze this in here. Okay. This one becomes simply the very same thing, but in terms of non-dimensional velocity and position. Okay. So nothing changes. Um, and this equation is almost the same thing again in terms of the non-dimensional variables, except that the Reynolds number appears as a factor. So that is the result that we have. So let's define what the Reynolds number is. So here, the Reynolds number is equal to rho v naught L naught divided by mu. And this you will remember um, as a number that assesses the ratio of the magnitude of the inertial forces over viscous forces. So when Reynolds number is very high, the inertial forces dominate. Let's say you have Euler or inviscid flow. If it's very, very low, viscous forces dominate. You have creeping or Stokes flow. And in between, you have just um, equal magnitudes of influence okay, on the solution. All right, so now that we do have the Reynolds number in there, we are going to be concerned with, in particular, so at this point, we're pretty much done with the core part of Navier-Stokes equations and how one deals with them, how one uh, interprets them. Now we want to take a step further and think about the case when the Reynolds number is sufficiently high. It doesn't have to be super high, but just sufficiently high so as to generate interesting dynamics, in particular, interesting dynamics that is um, analyzed in the context of so-called turbulence. And we want to address uh, the difficulty or observe and address the difficulty associated with turbulence. So before I move, questions? Um, right, so, so there is only, so, so here I mean, for instance, this is Laplacian, right? Gradient of the velocity divergence. So with this here, I mean Vi comma Jj, okay? Oops, not that. That's, we understand it in this case. Oh, but you're right. So to see the summation convention, I have to see the index appearing twice. But um, in this one instance, I think we understand where we are. Further questions? <coughs> 
The idea is the following. You have the Reynolds number that characterizes the nature of the flow. And um, the general convention is that there is a critical Reynolds number. And this Reynolds number, the critical value is something that is large, typically. Um, so it's of the order of, let's say, the typically accepted value is of the order of somewhere from 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4 in that range or in the vicinity of that range, depending on the, let me say, how well controlled your uh, experiment is. And it is deduced from highly controlled experimental setups, let's say flow in a pipe, et cetera. Right? So the, for the particular type of um, analysis that you are interested in, you might have more accurate values. Okay? But that is a typical value. So that's a large value. So if your Reynolds number um, exceeds that value, one says that you have fully developed turbulence. Okay? Not localized, but everywhere you have a flow field that is characterized by what one calls turbulence. So what you observe in turbulence, in other words, the thing that says this is a turbulent flow field, is the following. So first of all, you look at the structures in the flow field, okay? the distribution of the velocity, et cetera, and it is almost always fully three-dimensional. So you don't have a nice two-dimensional simplification to a flow that is turbulent. It has to be 3D. Okay? That's one. So like in, for instance, also just like in a mechanics problem, sometimes you simplify the problem to plane stress or strain. That simplifies your analysis. Similarly, in flow problems, you may wish to simplify to a two-dimensional analysis because it's easier, less costly to solve in a numerical setting. But in turbulence, you have to stick to 3D. That's what it tells us, essentially. Um, you observe a lot of randomness. Uh, so what, do you, what does one mean by randomness? So you look at the velocity, let's say, at a certain point. It doesn't change smoothly in time. It seems to be very irregular. You see oscillations. You see some chaotic behavior. And chaotic behavior rigorously, let me say, in, with, from, from a um, OD or PD perspective means that you carry out the very same experiment side to side with as nicely controlled conditions as possible. Nevertheless, in reality, there will be tiny, tiny changes in the conditions that you impose. And those changes, after a sufficient amount of time, will manifest themselves in such a way that the two flow fields will look completely different. So it's as though you're doing two different experiments. But no, actually, the experiments are the same. That's what chaotic means. If you don't have a turbulent flow, if you control the conditions very well, the flow fields, no matter how long you run them, will look very, very similar. You have similar situations in rigid body dynamics, et cetera. And a very good example is actually a um, double pendulum problem. But in any case, uh, that makes the flow field unpredictable to a certain extent. So you cannot say the velocity is going to take this value at this position at this time, because it's chaotic and it's very irregular. Um, the second one is that it is nonlinear. Okay? Nonlinear meaning when you look at the acceleration, you have these convective terms um, that play an important role. So you cannot simplify that. You have to deal with it. And in fact, as we will see, the second term is pretty much embodying the major difficulty with turbulence. That's going to, we're going to observe it very shortly. Um, turbulent flows are diffusive. Okay? So I'm, I'm pretty much listing what's, what is standard in, uh, in, in a discussion or introduction to turbulence. right? Um, so it's highly diffusive means, meaning that you have very rapid momentum and temperature mixing. So you have some flow, right? 
And let's say there is excess amount of heat generated in one region. If the flow is not turbulent, for that extreme temperature rise to be felt away from that region, it would take a lot of time, let's say. But in a turbulent flow, that occurs very, very rapidly because the fluid particles talk to each other very rapidly due to this extreme irregular um, behavior. All right? So when one says diffusion, it's not diffusion per se. It's not like you have temperature gradients or temperature gradients or uh, let me say uh, species gradients that makes this thing diffuse. No, it's like the chaotic motion is uh, inducing is this, this mixing. Okay? But that's the terminology that is used. Um, so then the last two items, you have a lot of vorticity. So we understand now at least conceptually what vorticity means. It means it's something that has to do with rotations. So when you look at the flow field in a turbulent flow, you will see rotational structures, a lot of swirling domains of fluid, and these are sometimes called eddies. So identifiable um, rotational, let's say, flow structures. And what is important is that these things occur at many different length and time scales. Okay. Um, and they typically, one can imagine, would go together. So if the length scale of the swirling motion is large, the, 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 the let me say, the rapidness with which that, rep, uh, that rotation appears to occur is slower than at small scales where it's super rapid. Okay? Um, and, and length scales, for instance, you can have, you can observe if you have a flow. I, I remember seeing one nice picture. Uh, it's, I think, like an island in the middle of nowhere in an ocean, and you have some flow. And I think from the clouds, etc., you can see these, let me say, eddies forming as the air moves around this island. And that is a eddy forming um, around a very large object, but then you could also have it forming at a very, very small scale, let's say near the boundary layer of an aircraft wing at a much, much smaller size. Okay? So you can have these forming at many uh, different length and time scales. And finally, of course, the probably the most important thing about Turbulence is that it's highly dissipative. And dissipation is something we can easily understand because, well, we have not defined dissipation. You'll have a chance to analyze uh, dissipation of fluid, and you can imagine where that's going to happen. But um, so, so, so dissipation has to do with velocity gradients, okay? Um, and suppose you have between two different points a difference in the velocity. And velocity gradient is the distance between the two points scaling the distance in the velocity, right? Delta V over delta X. That's an approximation to L or eventually to D, the, the stretching tensor. Okay? So that's what it turns out governs the dissipation. Now, if you have a certain amount of velocity change occurring at a very, very small length scale, then that velocity gradient is super large. And it turns out the corresponding Dissipation, therefore, is very large. And that's where, why, first of all, you always have dissipation in a fluid flow, but the dissipation in a turbulent flow predominantly takes place at small length scales. So viscosity, small length scales, because that's where the gradients are very large. Now, because turbulent flows are so dissipative, then one can think that if you want to maintain a turbulent, so if you initiate a turbulent flow, 
and do not continuously pump in energy. For instance, you do not continuously somehow keep shearing the fluid over a boundary layer, let's say. Viscosity will eventually dissipate so much energy that the velocities will slow down, turbulence will disappear. Okay, so one says that one needs to continuously put in energy in order to maintain a turbulent flow. Okay. But that sometimes or often naturally occurs um, within the problem that you are analyzing anyway. Um, all right, so that is what we are willing to, uh, let me say, the topic that we are willing to scratch the surface of a little bit, right? So, and we are going to be, based on these concepts, concentrating on, in particular, item one, okay? I will take the 3D equations, right? The general equations. And I will take, throw in all the nonlinearity, okay? Uh, all of these concepts are things that are uh, qualitative in nature. And uh, you can also, of course, make use of them when you're trying to develop um, a nice approach to the turbulence that you're trying to analyze. But for us, presently, the first three items, 0, 1, and 2, are what we're going to make use of. Okay? Um, so let's start. The starting point is the Navier-Stokes equations. First difficulty that we would like to address is the strong fluctuations of the velocity in time, okay? It might also strongly oscillate from point to point, okay? So as you move across your domain, the velocity will also, may also fluctuate and will also fluctuate very rapidly. But in the context of the approach that we are going to follow, we are going to concentrate on the oscillations in time. And the idea is to average, first of all, the highly oscillatory field in time. Okay, so we're going to do averaging. And for this, what I will do is, I will take a field, um, just some generic field, in fact, I picked it to be a scalar one, A of T, and I decompose it into its mean and oscillatory part. or the fluctuating part. Now, the idea that we are pursuing here is that we have a field that goes perhaps like that. Okay? That is A, and now this is going to be a bar, and the difference between the green line and the red line at an instance is going to be the fluctuation part, okay? Now, if I give you the signal A of t, then you can easily, of course, calculate A bar. So, in principle, what you would do for such a signal is A bar, you would say, is equal to, you would choose some um, starting time. Okay, you can start from time equals zero, and you choose a window of averaging. And that window is from t0 to t0 plus some time tau. So then you go ahead and average over that period, or that window. So A of t dt. Again, T0 can start from zero, and tau can be very, very large. So in principle, you can go from zero to infinity almost and scaled by that very, very infinitely large, if you like, number, right? And it will give you the mean of that signal. Now, I will introduce a notation, and I will call this operation, this averaging operation in time, I will indicate it, indicate it with brackets, just to make my life a little bit easier, okay? So when necessary, I will put a bar, okay? Let's also write this in red. And when necessary, I will indicate the operation of averaging with brackets instead of having to write this integral um, uh, once again. Now, what you have to be careful is that now we're going to apply this operation to um, velocity. 
And for the velocity, we're going to also decompose it into a mean part and a fluctuation part. Now, the difficulty is that the velocity at any given position is not necessarily going to be, let me say, um, from a, uh, when, when I look at this picture from far away, yes, there is a fluctuation, but it's clear that this fluctuation is around the line, okay? Uh, whereas, when I look at a real flow field, the real flow field is going to be probably, let's say, like this. So in other words, there are strong fluctuations, but there is the mean, if you like, also changes. Okay? So what I really want to do is, I want to somehow essentially filter out these oscillations and instead get a line that looks like this. So in my case, this will be V bar, and therefore it will be a function of time just like the velocity itself, so it's not going to be a constant in this motivational derivation or definition. Uh, it's going to change with time, but still the oscillations are somehow filtered out, okay? So how would one do that? I, how, how would one do this? Either, well, you choose your duration of averaging sufficiently small, so you take a tiny piece around a time of interest, you look a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, and the idea would be that these oscillations are so strong that I can't even draw them, draw them. And when I essentially zoom out, what I see is almost a mean variation and around it very, very strong oscillations similar to that one. That would be one way to think about it. And another way to think about it is to think about the highly chaotic nature of turbulence, and this is called, so, carefully chosen tau averaging duration. That would be one option. And the second one is associated with so-called ensemble averaging. And the idea is the following. Well, um, I run my simulation once, and this is what I would observe. I run it a second time. This is what I would observe. I'm, of course, highly idealizing it. I run it a third time. This is what I would observe, and so on. And I do this, let's say, a million times. And then I go to a certain point, let's say that point. And at that point, I have three values or million values for the velocity, the blue one, the black one, and the red one. I take them, sum them up, average them. And that gives me a single value. And that would be one way of sort of filtering out these oscillations and having a well-defined smooth variation, okay? So one way or the other, I can define this V bar, and V minus V bar defines the fluctuating part, All right? So there is, of course, a characteristic of this variation, um, this oscillation, and namely, if you calculate the average of the oscillation, that is equal to average of A minus A bar, Averaging is a linear operation, and therefore this is equal to average of A minus average of A bar. But A bar is a constant, it is itself, right? If I throw in A bar, it comes out, integrated, so that becomes tau over tau, that's one, so this is A bar, and this is by definition A bar, and therefore this is equal to zero. So the average of the fluctuation by definition is equal to zero, it applies also to our velocity field, and this is a vector, of course. Okay, so now we have our tool at hand. So what we want to do now is we would like to go back to Navier-Stokes equations and average them out, okay? And what are the equations? Let me remind you So we applied it to the velocity and now to the Navier-Stokes equations, which read, right, 
uh, minus gradient pi plus mu Laplacian v is equal to rho v dot. And this is subject to the constraint that the flow is incompressible. Okay? Now, then I will average out the equations as well. So I will put a bracket around that, bracket around that. And my hope is the following. Well, if I want to solve the Navier-Stokes equations in the turbulent regime, the flow fields, field is extremely oscillatory in time and space. So if you want to do this with a numerical method, your grid size, or if you're doing finite elements, the element size, whatever, has to be tiny, 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 plus the time step that you take in order to integrate your equations in time because you have acceleration also has to be tiny. So it's expensive in time and space. However, if I look at the smooth variation, now, not only through time, but also in space, the variations will hopefully be smoother. And the idea is, if I average these equations, perhaps I hope to achieve a set of equations which read like this. In other words, is it possible that I have the same set of Navier-Stokes equations, but not in terms of the actual highly oscillatory fields, but in terms of mean fields? which are much easier to dissolve, at least, okay, I cannot tell you what these oscillations are, they might be important, but at least I can tell you something about the mean field so you understand the characteristics of the flow. So the big question is, is this possible? If it is, it will simplify my life a lot. So let's see if that is the case. Now, if you look at those equations, um, the constraint, divergence-free nature, actually, you can already see it's not a tough one. So let's start with the mass balance. We are going to average out the divergence of the velocity. Averaging is a linear operation, so this is equivalent to the divergence because divergence only takes derivatives with respect to position whereas averaging is with respect to time. So I can move the gradient outside and I have the average of the velocity field. And that's nothing but V bar. Okay. So it turns out that the mean velocity field does indeed satisfy the divergence-free constraint. And since the original flow field is also divergence-free, the difference between the original and the velocity, mean velocity, in other words, the fluctuating part, is, of course, also divergence-free. I'm writing this because I'm going to make use of it, right? Div v0 divergence v bar is equal to 0. That's what we've shown. You take the difference of the two. Divergence of the fluctuating field also has to be 0, OK? Um, in fact, let us call this star. OK, good. Everything seems to look uh, optimistic, right? I got rid of the mass balance in a very simple manner. Let's look at now the linear momentum balance. OK, we're going to do the same thing. Minus gradient of P averaged, OK, plus average of mu Laplacian of V is equal to average of rho V dot. Um, then, I again, term by term, derivatives are with respect to space. I take them outside. This is minus gradient, average of P, which we can define to be P bar. Okay. Uh, plus mu comes outside. It's constant. Again, derivatives with respect to space and average of v, which is v bar. So, so it's, it's going so far so good, right? I'm almost there. I will get the same equations uh, as, as, as the original ones, except in terms of the mean quantities. So this is equal to, um, so let's write this again explicitly, rho del v del t plus rho gradient v operating on v. So when I take the average of that, okay, I will have 
rho del v bar del t. Now, I'm taking the time average and simultaneously there is a time derivative. So we should interpret that transition actually in view of the picture that I drew uh, just, just over there as follows. There are very rapid and smooth variations in time. When I concentrate on a tiny window, if, or if I am doing ensemble averaging over many instances or realizations of the simulation, I average out this V over those realizations or over a very, very tiny uh, time window to which the variation, the smooth variation is insensitive. So now, therefore, this T and that T are not really the same. Numerically, this is tiny, the changes in time, and numerically, that would be very large because now V bar is a smooth field, right? So th th that's a tiny complication perhaps, but uh, it can be easily argued that this is a nice and um, strong, let me say, rigorous transition. And then there is the second term. Okay? And that's what we have to now look at. So there is rho, that's a constant that comes outside of the integral, and on average of gradient V, So in the linear momentum balance, the first term, the second term, and the, let me say, the easy term in the acceleration on the right-hand side, they appear to be in terms of averages. It's just the very last term that is not easily interpreted. Okay? So let's have a look at that term. So here we have gradient of V operating on V. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw in the expression for V. V is equal to its average plus its fluctuation part, right? So it's gradient of V bar plus V tilde multiplying V bar plus V tilde. And I expand it out. I will get four terms, right? So let's do that. I will have gradient of V bar operating on V bar plus Gradient of V tilde operating on V bar plus gradient of V bar operating on V tilde. And finally, gradient of V tilde operating on V tilde. All right, uh, the first term, it's already in terms of mean quantity, so averaging is, it does not have an effect. That's equal to that. The second one, V bar comes outside, gradient comes outside, so you have gradient of the average of V tilde operating on V bar, but average of V tilde is zero, okay? Because that's the fluctuating part. So. This is equal to zero. Likewise, this is equal to gradient of V bar operating on the average of V tilde. That is also equal to zero. This term is not zero, because it's the average of the multiplication of two oscillating quantities. The average of the oscillatory part is zero, but the quadratic portions, they are not necessarily equal to zero. Okay, um, so, well, it's there, okay? So we cannot get rid of it. So however, what I will do is I will express it using star. Star is the thing that says divergence of the fluctuating part is equal to zero. If you make use of that, you can show that this is alternatively expressed as the divergence of V tilde bon V tilde. Okay? Divergence of the average of V tilde bon V tilde. Right? So those terms are equivalent upon using the divergence-free constraint. Good. <clears throat> 
saw, we started with the Navier Stokes equations and we averaged them out. And we ended up with minus, first of all, the averaged momentum balance simply says that divergence of the mean velocity field is equal to zero. And similarly, we have the averaged linear momentum balance, which says that minus gradient of p bar. Okay. Uh, now, there is another term there that is the, on the right-hand side, divergence of, or let me first write everything and then I will combine them. So there is also mu Laplacian of v bar is equal to rho del v bar over del t plus rho del v bar over gradient of v bar operating on v bar. And one final term, rho divergence of, I'm sorry, V tilde bond V tilde. So the left hand side averaged, the right hand side averaged, and there is just this extra term okay, that we cannot get rid of. Um, now these terms, it's equivalent to rho V bar dot. Del V bar del T plus a convective part. Okay, so that's how I'm going to write it. Now, this part I will throw to the left hand side. And then we remember that this left hand side has to do with the divergence of the stress. So I can always write it as the divergence of a stress. I'm going to throw it to the left hand side. So I'll combine into this alternative expression. I'm going to write divergence of a tensor, and I'm going to indicate it as T bar, is equal to rho V bar dot, the remaining terms on the right-hand side. Okay. So the original Navier-Stokes equations were divergence V is equal to zero, and divergence of the stress, which is these without the bars, is equal to rho acceleration. And in this case, we have something almost identical. The average mass balance and the average linear momentum balance, with the exception that T bar is not an average itself. It is equal to minus P bar identity plus two mu D bar, and D bar is the symmetric part of the mean velocity field, gradients, okay. okay? So this would be, let's say, L bar, the mean velocity gradient tensor, symmetric part is D bar. You throw these in into the divergence, you get these two terms, and that's what we had done before. Yeah, when deriving Navier-Stokes equations. But I also had another term now on the right-hand side. It already nicely is in a divergence form. So this is divergence of some additional contribution into T, and that's simply rho times this average. Okay. So let's write that in red. Minus rho V tilde bond. So what I call T bar is almost the average of the stress field 
except that there is an additional term. And that additional term is called R and it's referred to as the Reynolds stress tensor. Okay. And the whole averaging procedure with which we get these expressions is called Reynolds averaging. And in fact, the equations are called Reynolds averaged Navier-Stokes. Or runs. Okay. That's equation one, and that is equation two. Okay, so if you follow the procedure once again in your head, what we've done is conceptually very simple. The issue was the strong fluctuation in the velocity. And we said, well, let's filter that fluctuation out, well, or average it out in time. And eventually, perhaps, I can understand what happens to the mean velocity. It will give me an idea about the nature of the flow. And we did that, and we ended up, indeed, a equation similar to the origin one, a constraint on the mean velocity field, and a divergence of a stress equals rho v dot, just like the original equation, but in terms of almost mean quantities, I'm saying almost because the stress tensor has a mean part plus some additional strange contribution. Now, this contribution, namely the Reynolds stress tensor, is the thing, and remember it comes from the convective part of the acceleration, the nonlinear part, uh, that is the thing that causes all the trouble. If this is not there, okay, so let's omit it, okay? If it's not there, uh, then I have no trouble. I can solve for the mean field. But the thing is, for it to be not there, there is only one way. The fluctuations have to be small. Because if the fluctuations are small, this is a term that's quadratic in the fluctuations, it will be zero. But that means there is no turbulence, or it's negligible anyway. So if you have turbulence, you can't get rid of it. And if you have no turbulence, it's negligible anyway. And you're solving for the Navier-Stokes equations, the original ones, on, on a, for a not so challenging problem. So um, these are negligible if V tilde is small, but then you have really not a turbulence issue. Um, so then you go ahead and start counting the equations and the unknowns, right? There is one equation, three equations in there, and there is one unknown, or three unknowns in the velocity, mean velocity field, a fourth is the mean pressure four, and boom, another term. It's symmetric, but it has six independent components. So all of a sudden you have extra unknowns, and you possibly cannot solve for it. So now what do you do? Well, you do what you do in the case of the original linear momentum balance. When I had my original linear momentum balance, this thing had too many unknowns, so we said, well, let's link it to the kinematics. So that's what you do here as well. So what one does is one models the Reynolds stress tensor. So to solve runs, must model R, okay? And what you can do is you can perhaps try to model it in terms of mean fields. What you can say is, well, somehow argue that R is going to be something. It has this form, but I don't know what these fluctuations are, and I don't want to resolve them because that's precisely what I'm trying to avoid. And therefore, I'm going to try to somehow model its effect by things that I solve for. When what I'm solving for is V bar and P bar. So perhaps I can write a model for R in terms of, let's say, the velocity or its gradients, etc. So here I'm just going to write the velocity, but the mean one. Okay? This is not a very nice way to write a vectorial um, dependence of a tensor but I just wrote it anyway to just indicate that you would model it by 
mean quantities, because then you end up with four equations and four unknowns and mean quantities very nicely over time and space, and therefore the problem would be easier to solve. Okay? Um, now, there are certain instances when you, this modeling becomes a tiny bit easier. Um, for instance, R can be isotropic. And isotropic is actually, as a tensor, it's similar to, for instance, when you think about, and we haven't done that, but uh, for instance, when you think about a second order tensor that is isotropic and that appears, for instance, in Fourier's law of thermal conduction as the conductivity, if it's isotropic, it has to have the form R times identity. Okay? So there is the concept of isotropic turbulence that is homogeneous and uniformly distributed um, in space. So everywhere you look, you see the same rotational structures, let me say. Uh, in three dimensions, that's an isotropic turbulence, right? So it's similar to the idea of material isotropy. Irrespective of direction, you see the same uh, behavior, okay? Similarly, structurally, isotropy uh, applies here as well, and it simplifies the form of the Reynolds stress tensor, and you have only one additional term that you want to apply sort or model, okay? Um, and isotropic turbulence in certain um, uh, applications and scales, it is a reasonable approximation, okay? But if it's not applicable, then you're stuck with an isotropic turbulence. And then you have to model more degrees of freedom in R. But in any case, the idea would be somehow to try and model or to try and estimate what this is in a uh, manageable manner. What does manageable mean? It was with respect to the solution of the, macro the problem that you're trying to solve. You want to solve it cheaply a coarse resolution in space, and a coarse resolution in time, numerically. That's the idea, okay? Um, and it turns out that runs, in the context of turbulence, is the simplest thing you can do, okay? Um, now, there are a hierarchy of other models, okay? There is runs on one extreme, and there is the full solution of Navier-Stokes on the other extreme. So here I will just write runs, the simplest thing you can do. And, or let's write here otherwise. In other words, if you don't want to do that, full Navier-Stokes equations. And this is called DNS. DNS stands for direct numerical simulation. So the question is, so there is, first of all, there are two questions. One, there is turbulence. How is it generated? How can I, let me say, uh, model it if I'm doing a simplification, et cetera? And another question is, um, what do I need to resolve if I want to capture turbulence? So it turns out that if you want to observe turbulence, you don't have to really model it. So this is theoretically unnecessary. If you have immense computational power that apparently nobody has for practical problems of interest, then what you do is you take your Navier-Stokes equations, chop up your grid or your domain of analysis into tiny, tiny, tiny pieces, because why? Turbulence occurs at many different length scales. You want to capture all. Also choose tiny, tiny time steps. Why, again, length scales also differ a lot. And then you do your simulation. All the turbulence that you want to observe actually manifests itself. It's within Navier-Stokes. It's within the dynamics itself, right? But the problem is very expensive. But it's possible, and it's called DNS, direct numerical simulation. Now, it's super expensive. On the other extreme, you do your most extreme simplification, and that's runs. You run into a difficulty, and you try to model that difficulty, okay? And in between, there are other things. Now, but everything else other than DNS, which is not quite feasible in most scenarios, is a modeling approach, all of them, okay? Uh, and you might ask, well, are they successful? And there is a nice quote that you will see in many books regarding the success of modeling in turbulence, and it says, Turbulence is the graveyard of theories. So it turns out that they don't always work. There might be scenarios where they are successful, but there is no universal simplification to DNS, as in such a simplification, let me say, that will allow you to attack many different problems with the same ease. You always have to do something clever if you want to end up with a simplification. 
So that's so much on our discussion of Navier-Stokes, and we have um, covered so far uh, with this lecture five special topics, which I hope is giving you an idea of how continuum mechanics plays a role in these special topics of mechanical engineering. Okay, questions? <laughs>